Johnny and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business? We can help. It is Wednesday, and all of our guests today are brought to you by our title sponsor, Able Auctions, ableauctions.ca. Old guy Bruce, yep. just before we get to, uh, I didn't just yell that out randomly. Old guy Bruce, which could be a band name. Derek, we've had a lot of submissions uh, this week for band yeah. names. You may want to uh, mark that one down uh, as well. Old guy Bruce, Delaney's OK Tyron Langley inbox. Uh, saw Gordy Howe play from 57 till he retired. Wow. Got to give the nod to Ovi. Wow. Usually the old guys will go with the older guys. Yeah. But not old guy Bruce. You following that, Ryan? Good to hear. All right. Canucks in Calgary tonight. We're joined now from Sakaris and Price in the Rinkwide Podcast. Jeff Patterson. How are you, sir? I'm good, Donnie. I am in the spirit of the season. I, I like the studio there. It looks festive. Uh, Got to ask, though, Rick. Did you give the stockings the sniff test before you, you hung them? <laughs> right here behind me. I, I smelt both of them, before, and they passed. They yeah. passed. Good. Good. All right. Jeff, I don't smell my socks every day. Once in a while, <laughs> and Donnie, has, he's on board. Once in a while. Yeah. You know, not every day. Yeah. You smell them while they're on your feet, though, which is a little <laughs> little unusual. Yeah. Anyways. Okay, the whole Bo Horvat uh, situation. Uh, Jeff, do you understand where he was coming from releasing, or the Canucks releasing that statement yesterday? Uh, yeah, but, it, I mean, extraordinary, Donnie. We've all been at this uh, for a lot of years. Uh, have you ever seen a, a player release a statement through a team while he's on the ice at practice only to yeah, answer that. all the questions that he was trying to avoid right after the practice? Like The whole thing was bizarre. Uh, mind you, there's so much around this hockey club this year that is bizarre. So maybe it's just uh, par for the course. But I know I, I get where like he doesn't want to talk about it, yeah. and yet in the same breath, I thought he handled it as I expected he would, with complete class and dignity, and talking about apologizing to his teammates because it was becoming a distraction. Uh, I will say this though, and I've been around this team an awful lot this year, practices and games. It hasn't been a distraction for Bo because he really hasn't been asked about it an awful lot. He was yeah. asked the day before training camp, and he said all the right things then, and then he's gone about his business, and the 20 goals tells you that he has not allowed it to be a distraction. But obviously it reached a bit of a flashpoint earlier in the week, and yeah, I mean, the storyline's not going away. He can put out a statement, but... You know, he's in Calgary after the morning skate today. He's probably going to get asked about it by media there. They go into Winnipeg right after Christmas, another Canadian market. He's fortunate the Canucks have already been through Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa. But as we get closer to the trade deadline and he still remains a member of the Canucks, the question's going to come up. I guess what the statement does is it allows him a baseline to say, you know, hey, I've said what I've, all I'm yeah. going to say. I'm, you know, read the statement, whatever. But just the fact that he puts out a statement, that doesn't make the issue go away entirely. Yeah, I think it comes out of the category of give it a shot. Like, uh, you throw that out there. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it's uh, understandable. If, if the if the story goes to another l chapter or level, people are going to ask about it. I think, I think Bo knows that, but you, you give it a shot. How much do you think the Canucks regret the J.T. Miller extension? Yeah, I think as uh, the days go by here, there's probably a little bit of uh, regret. And and that's all due respect to JT Miller. The guy was a 99-point player last yeah. year. But through fiscal mismanagement of two regimes now, uh, eventually the dam was going to burst. Like, you can't retain all these players. And it's unfortunate that Bo Horvat's the guy that's going to end up bearing the brunt of all of this. You know, drafted a Canuck. Canuck is the only team he's played for. He's the captain here. You know, he says all the right things, and I do believe that he would like to to lead this team to greater heights on his watch. And look, if you're ever the captain of the Canucks and they win the Stanley Cup, you will get a statue outside of Rogers Arena. Now we're a long way from that, but it's just it's unfortunate because ultimately, if they do trade Bo Horvat, and it's certainly feeling like that's how this is going to play out, then this organization is going to spend the next bunch of years trying to find a replacement for Bo Horvat and you know a guy that can do all the things that that he can do here so uh, if you move Bo Horvat JT Miller I think by default moves back to the middle we know that that didn't work particularly well in the early going this season and so you know I, I don't want to say that JT Miller is not going to be able to perform for the Vancouver Canucks for the next bunch of years but Horvat's two years younger 
Uh, he brings those leadership qualities. I, I still think that there are questions about JT Miller on a nightly basis, and we saw it again the other night against Minnesota with the blind pass. Like, what is it going to take for him to eliminate the high-risk plays and just sort of continue to try to move this forward? Because uh, the more he makes the high-risk plays and they blow up in their face, uh, I'll, I mean, that was a huge turning point in the hockey game the other day. So I, I think there probably is some regret, but at the same time, I think they tried to shop Miller last year at the deadline through the summer, didn't like the offers they were getting, and they felt the best course of action was to commit to that player. But again, not enough money to go around. Uh, this management group hasn't done anything to create any sort of cap flexibility. And so ultimately, here we are. And uh, the here is that uh, it looks like they're going to have no choice but to move off their captain. Uh, what would you do with uh, Luke Shen? Uh, here we go, uh, UFA, another one, and that's our job to cover UFAs to, to you know figure out are the Canucks going to resign them or let them go. But this guy's so respected in the dressing room, management, coaches, uh, the scouts, everybody loves this guy. Um, we are hearing internally that the Canucks just uh, obviously love the guy, but you know this is a franchise with not many draft picks and they gave up so many this guy's going to get you a draft pick uh jeff what do you do with him at the deadline yeah i mean all the respect in the world for luke shen uh, i think all the respect for luke shen in that locker room as you say and around the league and the fact yeah. that he's got a couple of cups as well uh you know that might boost his value like if you looked at luke shen and thought well the player at this stage of his career maybe he gets you a fourth rounder honestly uh a lot of those intangibles maybe uh it bumps his price up i just think he can't fall in love with those kinds of players from a management perspective fans certainly can fall in love teammates they love that guy uh, fights for this team hits for this team even the other night against Minnesota, you know, nobody had anything going. You saw Bruce Boudreau refused to pull the goalie because he said, I didn't think my team was going to score. And yet in a dog of a game like that, Luke Shen had more than half of the team's block shots and he had a quarter of the hits uh, that the Canucks racked up. You know, so he comes, he brings it every night. But I just think if there is a trade market for a guy like Luke Shen, and for the reasons you mentioned, Rick, not many draft picks, not much in the pipeline, I think you have to, from a management perspective, be wary of falling in love with a player who, you know, is a few years beyond 30 now. And the problem there is in isolation, like he's playing some of the best hockey in his career. I get that. But you've got OEL, you've still got Tyler Myers. You know, how many guys can you get that are moving towards their mid 30s when we know that this defense core needs an overhaul? It has to get younger, it has to get faster, it has to adapt to playing the modern game. And so they've got to do whatever they can to surround Quinn Hughes. Uh, with better quality defenders. And so with all due respect to Luke Shen, if there's a trade market for him, I think you have to look long and hard at making that deal. Yeah. Connects in Calgary tonight, uh, Jeff. If indeed Jack Stadnika is in the top six, can you understand why? Well, the guessing continues, right? I mean, we've seen so many guys play on that line with Horvat and Miller. Besser's had a chance there. Garland's had a chance there. Hoaglander goes from the top line to the press box, and his season's just a yo-yo. So, look, I have no issues with Jack Stunica. I think he's hustled and tried hard uh, when he's, you know, since he came back from the injury. This is a guy that was drafted with uh, some high offensive pedigree. So they're hoping, I think, to sort of untap some of that. But let me say in the same breath, the fact that Jack Stunica is getting that opportunity and Vasily Podkolzin, a top 10 draft pick, mm. is toiling down in the farm. Yep. And I know it wasn't a great start mm. to the season for Podkolzin, but just the optics of this guy that you make a trade for and you're hoping that he gets a new lease on life coming over from Boston, and yet you've got a guy as a top 10 pick who has to be part of what you're trying to build here moving forward and you've got him down on the farm because he couldn't get into this lineup. I don't know. I have a bit of an issue with that, but you know that's not a knock on Jack Stanika. I hope yep. it works for him. But I think part of this, guys, is, and we come back full circle to the Bohorvat discussion, I mentioned you know, Garland, Besser, Hoaglander, <laughs> throw Tanner Pearson in there because he played with Horvat early in the season. All these guys are struggling. Why are they struggling? Because as much as Bo does many good things, goal scoring and face-offs and leadership, He's not a puck distributor playmaker. And I think the proof in that is JT Miller now has gone, you know, seven without a goal, one in his last 11. The Canucks have one playmaking center on this team, and that's Elias Pedersen, but he can't play with everybody. So good luck to Jack Studica. I hope it works for him. I hope he makes the most of his opportunity because this much we know for sure, if he doesn't, Bruce isn't going to waste any time 
try and somebody else, maybe Dakota Joshua is the next guy to get that opportunity. Yeah, well, the, the, you just said it, Jeff. This Sadika experiment could last two shifts. It could it could last could last a, uh, a period, but uh, we tend to make a big deal about lines on this show, and the, the media does a, as a whole. Hey, Jeff, thanks for this. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. All right, Ricky, keep those socks clean. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I will, Jeff. I yeah, will, Jeff. Yeah, just stop sniffing them. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Appreciate it. Okay.